Um, last week, we, uh, we had a look at why the transfiguration wasn't in John's Gospel. That was kind of the main thing we were looking at and all the associated goodies that came along with it. Uh, next week, we're starting our, uh, our series in Ephesians. We'll be in Ephesians for a very long time, many, many, many months. So this is our, our last morning before we start that. And we're going to look at a couple of other omissions from John's Gospel. John's Gospel is a unique book written very differently from the other Gospels. And there are many omissions. There are many things that you would expect to see there that you see in the other Gospels that you don't see in John's Gospel. There's no lepers being healed. There's no demons being cast out. And as we saw last week, there was no transfiguration. And for those of you who weren't here, the summary really of the, of the transfigurations uh, not being there in John's Gospel is simply that because for John, the theme of glory was so significant in that the glory was what happened at the cross. At the cross, the character of Jesus Christ, showing him to be the perfect keeper of covenants, a, an evidence, if you like, for his deity, was revealed at the cross. And even though John was there on the Mount of Transfiguration for this miraculous event... He doesn't put it in his gospel because to put the transfiguration in his gospel is to take the glory away from the cross and to put the glory somewhere else. And more so, it takes glory and makes glory a very Old Testament kind of concept. The cloud and the fire and the shining brightness of God. And it removes it away from the concept of glory as being God's revealed character. Which as John showed us um, in chapter 1 is actually uh, an Old Testament concept too. So this week I want to just deal with two more omissions. Mostly we're going to deal with the Last Supper. But firstly we'll do another, another one quite quickly. If you turn to uh, John's Gospel and chapter 19. And we'll look at verse 1. One other thing that is missing in John's Gospel that I think is significant and leads quite nicely into our third one is the omission of scourging. Not a word we typically use every day, and that's fortunate because we don't see it every day. But if we look at chapter 19 and verse 1, we're told that Pilate took Jesus and he flogged him. Now, these days when you read your Bible, you've probably got you know, 50 different versions in English that you can choose from. And it seems that in different versions, that often there will be different words for the same thing. And so it is very normal and familiar to us to see lots of different words used for the same concept. So we have whipping, we have flogging, we have scourging, we have these different things. What we don't understand sometimes is that sometimes it's not just a difference in translation, but there's different Greek words. In fact, there are three different Greek words for whipping of some sort that is used in the Gospel accounts. And without getting into too much detail, we could categorize them. A category one whipping, which would be someone taking a whip and sort of whipping you a bit as a punishment. A category two whipping, which would leave you a lot worse off. And the scourging was as bad as you could imagine. This is when uh, attached to the whip would be bits of rock or bits of glass or things like that. And it would literally just rip the skin off your back. It was the most inhumane punishment. Now Jesus had all three types of whipping. But what is interesting in John's Gospel... Here, when it says that Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, that's a category one word. That's him just getting a little whip. But we know from other gospel accounts, Matthew 26, for example, we know that Jesus was scourged. So why does John omit it? Why does he not tell us a, that there was a worse whipping? Because in the same way that the transfiguration takes the glory away from the cross. Remember, when John... The cross and glory come together in one harmonious unit. 
All of the theme of glory in John's gospel comes together with the great glorification of the Son of Man at the cross. Glory and the cross are linked. Now, with the transfiguration, we're taking glory away from the cross and it's somewhere else. But with the scourging, we're taking the cross, we're taking the suffering, and we're taking glory away from it. We're moving it away from glory. And so, by, the, by having a very extreme punishment of Christ, then the cross becomes a place of great suffering, rather than a place where Christ is glorified. You want to go into Matthew's Gospel, and boy, do you see the suffering of Christ laid out in very grim details. The, the crown of thorns, the mocking, the, the, the scourging, the spitting on him, all the different things that were said. And for Matthew, who is really a modern-day Jeremiah, and who is showing the Jews that just like in Jeremiah's day, they have rejected God and rejected God's appointed uh, spokesman. That in the, and that they are going to be judged as a generation because of that. That in Matthew's gospel, the suffering that Christ went through is very much a central theme. And the focus is on it. But in John's gospel, because of this cross glory linking together, because everything comes to the cross... That's why I think he doesn't put the scourging in. Now that leads us quite nicely to the third, the final, and probably the most significant omission, which is the Last Supper. Keep your finger in John 19. We'll be flicking around a bit today. Come with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. I'll get there before you because I've marked it because I knew we were going there. In Matthew 26, we have this account of the Last Supper. In verse 17, uh, we're told on the first day of unleavened bread, all the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare to eat the, uh, for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover. And it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. Notice, he reclined with the twelve. That's how they would sit and eat, they were reclined, they're gathered together for the meal, and the twelve are there. He's having this last supper with the twelve disciples. So John is there. That's important to know. As they, said, uh, as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. They were very sorrowful, began to say, one after another, is this I, Lord? And he answered, he who has dipped his hand in a dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would, not have, it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. I could get distracted here. Some good stuff. But we'll keep moving. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now here we come. Institution of the Lord's Supper. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, uh, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now the reason they sung a hymn there wasn't just because they were happy and wanted to do a sing song. It's because that was part of the Passover meal. That was, um, that was part of the process. And so what we call the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper is a part of the Passover meal that they were there having. But in, in taking that portion of the Passover meal, they institute what we call the Lord's Supper or communion today. And we're all hopefully fairly familiar with it. Now, in John's Gospel, it's the only Gospel where this supper doesn't happen, where this reference to the Passover doesn't happen. Now, this omission is very, very significant for multiple reasons. Firstly, like the Transfiguration, John was there. It's a very significant event. John was there for it. And therefore, if he's writing a gospel, you'd think he put it in. 
So if he hasn't put it in, there has to be a reason not to. Because it's such an important and significant event. Secondly, at the Last Supper, there was not grape juice, there was wine. And wine is a theme that runs throughout John's Gospel. Way back in chapter 2, we had the first miracle of Jesus that occurs at a wedding where he turns water into wine. And that is a theme of John's Gospel. So it seems even more necessary that John would use that as continuing that theme and he would make reference to the Last Supper. In addition to that, the Last Supper is the instituting of the covenant, the new covenant, by which our sins are forgiven. And John, more than any other gospel writer, is interested in this transition from the old covenant to the new covenant and the differences between them and the difference that it makes practically. John is is totally focused on that theme. And here is the very, very event that inaugurates that new covenant and John hasn't mentioned it. Doesn't that just seem crazy? So there's plenty of reasons why he should have put it in, but he hasn't put it in, and we need to look and find why. And the answer is going to be found in three verses from verse 28 of John 19 and on. So John chapter 19 and verse 28, 28 through 30. John's Gospel, as I keep telling you, is the richest of books. If I was teaching John's Gospel and we came to verse 28, I think we would probably take three weeks over these three verses. What you're going to have today is the barest of skimming of the surface. There is so much depth here that it's, it's just so magnificent. And I think here we'll see a lot of truths, a lot of great truths, a lot of shocking truths perhaps to some of you. Um, I'm hoping that everybody will learn something new today. But more so we'll see why John hasn't put the Lord's Supper into his gospel. So let's look at these three verses. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. These are just magnificent words. Listen, first of all, let's look at the structure because John particularly when he's taking care over his words, and he always is, but when he's, when he's putting these very, very important sections together, every word is exactly in its place. So we have here in these three verses a section, and it's marked out for us as a section by a sandwich again, or an inclusio if you want to be more theological. At the beginning, he says, knowing that all is now finished, or some versions will say completed, And then at the end, he says, it is finished. So we have a finished sandwich, as it were, a finished inclusio. This section begins with finished and it ends with finished. Because guys, no surprises, this is the finish. This is the end. This is what it's all been about and this is what it's all for. Everything has been building up to the cross. Now, John chapter 12, Jesus says, after Judas betrays him, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. The cross is going to happen. The Son of Man is going to be glorified. And all of this glorification that he's been building up to, these three verses is when it is finished. Is when it happens. So the first thing he does, he says he knows that it's finished. And he said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Why does I thirst fulfill the scripture? Now, people will search around in the Old Testament for references to thirsting, and they'll find nothing. There was no obvious Old Testament scripture that says, I thirst, or the Messiah will thirst. It doesn't exist. It's not there. So what's going on? How does that fulfill scripture? Well, the answer is back in John chapter 4. We don't have to turn there. Hopefully you know it. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at the well. And he says to her at the well, he says, if you knew who it was who was asking for water, you would ask me because he says that he will give her living water. And what happens if she drinks that living water? 
If she drinks that living water, she will never thirst again. Now it becomes clear in that passage and elsewhere in John's Gospel that this theme of water is talking about the the Holy Spirit, but more specifically the salvation that the Holy Spirit brings. It's talking about the institution of that new covenant relationship. Not the old covenant where there needs to be a continual cleansing, but where the very source of cleansing, the water, is not something external, but it's a spring within and the water comes out from within. And because the water is within, the Spirit of God dwells in believers in the new covenant, then there is never a need to be cleansed again. You will never thirst again. And Jesus is offering this woman who is unsaved the opportunity to be saved. That under a new covenant salvation, she will have the spirit of God in her. And she will forever be clean in God's sight. And in that imagery, she will never thirst again. Now, John's theme of water is one of the most consistent and dramatic of all the themes in his gospel. So when he then comes to the climax of his gospel, and Jesus, the one who said to the woman, I'll give you water and you will never thirst again. When he then says, I thirst, we're supposed to go, what? That's crazy. How can the one who is the source of living water, the rock who is struck and water comes from, be in a position when there is no water? He's thirsty. It's as if Jesus is presenting himself, or John is presenting Jesus, perhaps more accurately, as an unsaved man. Now, I don't know exactly what happened on the cross in those hours of darkness. But Matthew quotes Psalm 22 and verse 1, which says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In some way, shape or form, God the Father, who is one with the Son, forsook the Son... Because the sin of the world was placed upon him. And in some way, there was some sort of separation, some sort of forsaking between the father and the son. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Because we know they're one and they're inseparable. And yet we know that God cannot tolerate sin. And we know that he who knew no sin became sin for our sakes. Now, I'm not alone in not being able to answer this for you. Martin Luther famously was seen pondering this text. And he was grunting and groaning. And and people gave him a wide berth all day long as he tried to wrestle with this text. And finally he got up, pushed his books away and walked away from the table. And he was heard to mutter, God forsaking God. Who can understand it? That's kind of how I feel. And if he didn't get it, then I'm surely not. But there on the cross, Christ saying in John's Gospel, I thirst, is a direct parallel to Psalm 22. And Jesus, uh, and Matthew's Gospel, quoting that, that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How does I thirst fulfill Scripture? It fulfills Scripture because God forsook the Son. That's, what it, that's how it fulfills scripture. Now, I could say a lot more about that and water and everything else. It doesn't, of course, end there. We see that, that he who thirsted when he is struck in the side following the crucifixion in a few verses time, that not just blood, but blood and water flowed out. Just as in the book of Exodus, Moses struck the rock and water came from it. Just as Jesus had promised that water would come from him, so we see that he may have been thirsting there, but when he said it is finished, it really was finished, and water did come forth from him. But we'll leave that and we'll move on. And we see in verse 29, a jar full of sour wine stood there. So he says, I thirst. 
And conveniently enough, they have sour wine there. Not nice wine, sour wine. Funnily enough, in, when um, Stefano read it in Psalm 69 about sour wine, his version used the word vinegar. That gives us an idea of how that sour wine would have tasted. Not exactly pleasant. But if there's one thing that the Bible does in repetition is it draws our attention to something. And John is very, very good on this. He just, he repeats things and mentions things when we need to see them. And look how many times sour wine is mentioned. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, do you think John's making a point? That's three times sour wine is mentioned. Now, I'm cleverly linking the two sermons. Tonight we're going to come back out. We'll look more at Psalm 69. And when we look at Psalm 69 tonight, we're going to in particular have a look at how it affects John chapter 2 and the, uh, the, all the shenanigans that went on in the temple. Uh, when Jesus caused a bit of a, bit of a hoo-ha, as it were. But... Also Psalm 69, a very messianic psalm, in verse 21 it says, They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine. Now Psalm 69 is a lament psalm. It is a psalm of suffering. It is a psalm of separation. Whenever the New Testament quotes the Old Testament or alludes to the Old Testament, it's not alluding to that one word, that one verse. It's alluding to the entirety of that context. And so it is very relevant to us. This is why we had uh, Stefano read it for us this morning. That Psalm 69 is a psalm where it starts off, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I'm sinking. I'm in deep mire. I'm in trouble. I'm lost. I Help me. Help me. Help me. It's a lament song. And that's the situation that Jesus was in. More so than that, it was not just him in difficulty. Uh, I am weary with crying out, my throat is parched. There perhaps is the closest you'll get to a reference of thirst. Um, my eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. Those three hours of darkness on the cross must have seemed like an eternity. More in number than the hairs of my head, this is verse 4 of Psalm 69, are those who hate me without cause. So Jesus is hated, which is why he is on the cross. Mighty are those who will destroy me. And... Um, it goes on and it, we'll talk about it more tonight. I don't want to spoil my treats for tonight. But simply to say that we have him uh, in deep trouble, the psalmist. We have people against him and turning on him. And they give him poison for food. And this nasty, vinegary, sour wine is the only drink he gets for his parched throat. And so when Jesus takes the sour wine, he again, like with I thirst, he is fulfilling this concept of the Messiah being forsaken by God and also hated by man. There's all of this going on the cross. But there's more to, <coughs> pardon me, the sour wine. Sour wine, of course, is made from grapes, but not just any grapes, they're made from sour grapes. We have the expression sour grapes still today, don't we, in some circumstances. Do you want to turn just briefly, because this is very important. Turn with me to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. <clears throat> Remember, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, is that transition from the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law, to what, uh, what happens then following the cross, which is the new covenant, the forgiveness of sins, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, the promise of the new covenant is found in Jeremiah 31. Um, it's very well known. You can easily remember it if you can remember 31 because it's chapter 31 and verse 31. So in chapter 31 and verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day that I took them out uh, by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. 
I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no one, uh, no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they should all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is great. This is the promise of the new covenant. Okay. Now, a few things to know. Firstly, the new covenant is a covenant made not with us, the church, but made with Israel. It's made with Israel. And it has not been fully completed yet. It's not been fully fulfilled because one day the nation of Israel will be the ones believing and receiving the blessings of this covenant. But for now, this is Romans 9, 10 and 11. For now, Israel is in darkness. And we, like the... Like the uh, cast outs on the street have been called into the party where the invitees have not turned up and we are coming and we are sharing in this feast that was never ours to begin with unless of course you're Jewish for the rest of us who are Gentiles it never was ours to begin with but we've been called in and we're grafted on as unnatural branches and we're receiving the blessings of this covenant but this is the promise of the covenant notice that there will be um, that I will write my law within them, I'll write it on their hearts. There is something in this new covenant that is very internal. The old covenant, which is clearly a distinguished from, the old Mosaic covenant, was an external covenant where there was a continual need for cleansing. The new covenant, as Jesus expressed with this living water concept springing from within, the new covenant is one where the change happens inwardly and it's able to happen, you're able to have this because sins are forgiven not covered over not temporarily dealt with sins are forgiven in this covenant everything that we've done no matter how bad past, present and future is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ our sins are completely forgiven through this covenant now if we just go back just that little bit further and look at this new covenant a bit more. Uh, let's look at verse 27. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. I will sow the house of Israel, the house of Judah, with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that as I watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow and destroy and bring harm. So in other words, as I overlooked Israel and I judged them for their sin, for breaking the first covenant... He says, in the same way, so I will also watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. So God, in the same way that he judged them, is going to remember his other covenants. He is going to lift them up. He's going to rebuild them. In those days, they shall no longer say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are on edge. But every man shall die for his own sin. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Oh, this is so good. If you were here last week, do you remember when we read about the character of God being revealed in Exodus 33 and 34, that God says, though he forgives sin, he is not going to ignore it completely. He has to deal with sin because that's who the character of God is. And he talks about judging down to the third generation. And I said to you in passing, I said, don't worry about that because that's Mosaic law and that was true then, but that's not part of Mosaic law anymore. Or rather, we're not under Mosaic law. Here is a reference to how the fathers have eaten sour grapes, they've committed sin, and the children are being judged because of the sins of their fathers. That's what happened under Mosaic law. And here in this passage about the new covenant, it specifically says this isn't going to happen anymore. Very occasionally you still come across it in some Christian circles, these ideas of generational curses. Your grandfather did this and that's why you're struggling with that. Hocus, pocus, bogus nonsense. Rubbish, scubala. Nothing true about it at all. That's under Mosaic Covenant. It's done, it's finished. 
That isn't going to happen anymore. But there's something else here that is really quite clever. Well, there's two more things. Firstly, notice how sour grapes are linked with the changing from old to new covenant. Right? That's what's happening. We'll come back to that in a minute. But notice here. It's saying in the new covenant, when you eat sour grapes, you're the one who has your teeth going like that. You're the one who tastes it. You get the effect of your sin. You're the one. Nobody else. You're responsible for your sin. And yet, how does the old covenant end? It ends with Christ having his teeth set on edge by the sour grapes that we ate. How's about that? The very last act of old covenant history was somebody taking sin on behalf of somebody else. Drop mic. That's just brilliant to me. Isn't that just amazing? That the whole old covenant system was set up so there's punishment of others because of sins that others have done. And it seems so wrong and unfair because the whole of the old covenant is going to end with the holy one who committed no sin being punished for all of our sins. Isn't that just marvelous? And so the sour wine links us to the new covenant. Can you see now a little bit about why that last supper is not there? At the last supper, Jesus said, here, Take and eat this. Here, take and drink that. And in doing that, he's saying, I am instituting something. Now, did the new covenant start when they took the, the bread and they, uh, and they drank the cup at that, uh, at that Passover meal? No. It had to wait until it was finished. So, he's not got an opportunity to say, hold on a sec, folks. Uh, I'm just about to die on the cross here. Would you just all take a moment? We're going to do the Last Supper now. He can't do that. So he does it with them in the final Passover meal. And then he goes to the cross to fulfill the Passover festival. Another central theme of John's Gospel. To fulfill the Passover festival, showing that he is the Passover lamb. That he is the sacrifice. And so what John has done is he's taken the Last Supper out of his Gospel where the New Covenant is looking to the cross and he's gone and he's put the drinking of that cup on the cross right where it happens, right in the section where it is finished. In the middle of that finished sandwich, he's put it there. Isn't that just astonishing? Oh, I'm not finished yet. There's one more thing. The sour wine is put up on a hyssop branch. A hyssop branch was a branch that had uh, little leaves and, 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 and on it and, uh, and what have you. And it was, it was conveniently used to sprinkle water. There's that word again. There's that theme again. And blood during sacrifices. You'll see it mentioned in Leviticus um, where it is used for that very purpose. And where did that concept of using the hyssop branch originate from? It started in Exodus chapter 12, at the very first Passover. And at that Passover, the Jews were told, the last curse is coming, the angel of death is going to pass over, and the firstborn of every household will be killed, unless you kill the lamb, and you put the blood of the lamb on your doorposts with a hyssop branch. The Passover lamb, that the very first Passover, had the blood there put on the door with a hyssop branch. And here, the perfect, ultimate, fulfilled Passover lamb has the wine representing blood in the Last Supper, in the Lord's Supper, the wine passed to him and applied to him with the same hyssop branch. Isn't it just magnificent how it all comes together? One last thing. <laughs> because I can't really leave it without commenting on this. So he receives that sour wine. In receiving the sour wine, the old covenant has come to an end. 
The new covenant has begun. The first taking of this new era has begun. And so Jesus is able to say, it is finished. In Greek, tetelestai. One word. And with that, it's done. Little insight about tetelestai. When um, in the late 1800s, people were studying the Greek of the New Testament and there were some out there who suggested that, you know, this, this Greek that we find in the Bible is a bit different to classical Greek and maybe it was a special Greek given by God just for the Bible, you know. So you've got like classical Greek, which is, you know, pretty good stuff, but there's this Bible Greek that's higher. It's a better kind of Greek. It's maybe Holy Ghost Greek, somebody famously once called it. And then what happened is a German guy called Deismann was digging, uh, I think it was the Onki Rinkus digs, is what they were called. They were digging in the sands of Egypt. And they dug up and they found a massive find of manuscripts and stuff, which took them decades and decades and decades to sort out. Um, I've got all sorts of stories about that for another day, maybe. But they, uh, they dug up these manuscripts and they found parts of the Bible. They found Bible quotes and what have you. I, uh, many years ago, had the privilege of going to a museum in Oxford, very pri- not a public one, a private place. I went with a friend of mine who is, is well known in these kind of circles. And we got to look at the oldest existing manuscript containing a part of the book of Revelation. And nobody, it had been dug up in the sands of Egypt. 50 years later or something, it had been, pu- they finally worked out what these scraps of paper were and they published it. And decades have gone on since then and nobody had ever been to see it. And we got to see it. One of the highlights of my life. So they dug up this Bible. They dug up, they dug up other stuff. They dug up letters. They dug up bills. And do you know what they found on the bills? When somebody today has a bill, or maybe not today because we were computerized, but certainly 20 or 30 years ago, if you had a bill and then you paid your bill, then the person after they received the payment will get a little stamp and go, boom, paid. And, and stamp it over the bill, right? In those days, they wrote over the bill, Tetelestai. It is finished. Our debts paid by the sinless lamb who died the perfect death after the perfect life to fulfill the old covenant and to bring in the new so that our sins could be forgiven So that torrents of living water could be within us. So that he who came from last week, we saw this, and tabernacled amongst us, that he went and left the Spirit. So under this new covenant, the Spirit of God would indwell us. That we would be the temples. That we would be the tabernacles. And that we would take the gospel to this lost and dying world. All of that happened And that moment on the cross, it is finished. And at that moment, at that moment, he bowed his head. And what did he do? He gave up his spirit. Right to the final breath, he was fully in control. I've done what needs to be done. The sin of the world has been dealt with. Job done. And he breathed his last. And with that death, we have life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the richness of your word. The depth of your word. How different books of the Bible written over a thousand years apart just harmoniously joined together to present the message of the cross. Thank you, Lord, that we live in this most glorious of eras where we are new covenant saints and where people like us who were never even promised that covenant to begin with can enjoy the fruits of it grafted on. Oh, we thank you, Lord, that you are the one who forgives our sins. And may we encourage sinners to reach out to you. Their only hope. Our only hope. We thank you that you took the punishment 
in our place. We thank you that you made a way. Thank you for saving us. Amen.